For right now, first I know we can just find the same for right now. And we just know what it will have. Step, 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 step. Then we can actually see it. Make sure that Same one with bend the light up like that. So the short throat, short throat projector. So that's a good thing. Can you pull those cables out of out of this walking area. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a short throw projector. Pretty nice. Yeah, that way you can see I'm real close. Well, that's the right title. Well, that's a, I think so. You've got a really good chance. I hope so. <laughs> I'm still not bad now. And
I think just like in the hotel, that was like pretty much That's been known to happen. Yes, it has happened to me. Numerous occasions, especially up here. This third floor is like. Yeah, it's, it's a maze. It is. Imagine Nicholasville Road integrating land use and transportation planning presentation. 
My name is Steve Ross. I'm the branch manager for strategic planning at KYTC Central Office. We have two excellent speakers with us today on this topic. Ann Warnick, Ann is the supervising traffic engineer with WSP USA in the Lexington, Kentucky office. Ann has been with WSP for 14 years and currently manages the traffic engineering and transportation planning group in Kentucky. She is a licensed PE, professional traffic operations engineer, and is IMSA traffic signal field technician level two and roadway lighting technician level one certified. Anne has worked on a wide variety of projects throughout her career, ranging from transportation planning to traffic forecasting, modeling and analysis, traffic signal and roadway lighting design, traffic signal timing, and inspection of traffic signals and roadway lighting. Outside of work, Anne enjoys spending time with her husband, Derek, and two young boys, Theo and Tyler, ages two and four. Kenzie Gleason. Kenzie is a senior planner and assistant director with the Lexington Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. She coordinates with a team of planners and local officials to guide how federal transportation dollars are invested in the Lexington area. Kenzie began her work with the MPO development, developing bicycle, pedestrian, and trail plans, passion that still informs her work today, helping Lexington achieve its goals for a more human scaled, walkable, and transit friendly transportation system. She was the project manager for the Imagine Nicholasville Road Study, a plan to develop Lexington's first bus rapid transit line. Please join me in welcoming. Kenzie's going to be up first. Kenzie and in Ann. I don't get here, so I'm still catching my breath. Put the water here. All right, well, thank you for uh, joining us this very late afternoon. Um, one thing that uh, Steve didn't mention in my bio is that because the Lexington area is a relatively small NPO, we're housed within the city of Lexington as well. So that means that we're the transportation planning staff um, for the city of Lexington, their division of planning and staff to the planning commission. So we're kind of in a unique position to both influence transportation decision-making as well as land use decision-making for Fayette County. Um, and before I talk about Imagine Nicholasville Road, I want to introduce you quickly to Imagine Lexington, which is the city's comprehensive plan. It was really the main reason why we undertook this study to begin with. And before I start, just out of curiosity, how many of you are familiar with Nicholasville Road in Lexington? Okay, so good. I don't describe a whole lot of details about it. I want to know what we're talking about. So um, our comprehensive plan is updated every five years. And during the last update, which was in 2018, we partnered with a nonprofit organization called the Bluegrass Community Foundation. And they wanted to help us engage the community in a more um, elaborate way than we had in the past in the comprehensive plan. So they devised this idea, I think stolen from somewhere else, as all good ideas typically are. Um, to do a, an event called On the Table, where different small groups of people throughout the community were encouraged to um, get together and gather around food and have conversations about what they'd like to see for the future of Lexington. And then sort of the key takeaways from each of those conversations was communicated back to the planning. We had about 10,000 people participate. Um, and really the result was that it's pretty clear, at least at the time in our community, that there was still a pretty strong recognition that Land really is a scarce and finite resource that we want to protect in Bay County. And there's a commitment to continuing the tradition of having our urban growth bank boundary, which was the first in the country established in 1952. Um, so essentially that means we're to the point where we really have to get serious about building up because we have no land within the urban, or very little land within the urban service boundary to um, build out towards. Um, but there was also a very strong sentiment that we need to maintain the character of our existing neighborhoods. You know, everybody is all for density in theory, but never in their own backyards, not surprisingly. So 
one of the key strategies and outcomes was that we would really look to add that intensity along our major arterials, particularly in our commercial areas where we have a lot of underutilized land, either in parking lots or in buildings that are no longer in the use that they once were. You know, the face of retail is changing, the face of office is changing post pandemic, we may not go back to that. So, um, or at least not go back to as much office space as we once had. But the, the caveat was that they want that new development to be a much higher quality and much less sprawling um, along those four walls in the future. So really there was a consensus. Um, you know, all the people that participated in on the table clearly love their community enough to do that. They recognize that Lexington has a lot of great attributes that attracted them to the community and they know that more people um, will probably share the same. So we really do have to provide for that housing and the jobs and accommodate all those folks. But they also agreed that they're significantly concerned about more traffic congestion. Um, there's not a whole lot of things that everybody agrees on, but dislike of traffic congestion is certainly one of them. Um, about 25% of the comments that we collected through Imagine Lexington were about transportation related concerns. And you know, every thriving city has some degree of congestion. It's sort of a um, indicator of economic activity but what happens when you've really maxed out your ability to uh, meet that demand, at least as far as people traveling by car, which is essentially the case for Nicholas Bull Road. It's really maxed out. It carries about 75,000 cars between Man of War and uh, New Circle Road, which is more than some segments of I-64 and 75 in Fayette County. Um, it's 10 lanes at its widest point. And there are so many people well, probably are among them that avoid Nicholas Road Road at all costs, particularly in peak hour because um, they just recognize that the level of congestion. So even if we were to add vehicular capacity, we're pretty certain that that would be eaten up with latent demand pretty quickly as people you know, see the opportunity for um, using the road, whereas they're otherwise avoiding it. So we really thought it was important when we start and we're, we're planning to do corridor plans for all of Lexington's major corridors and look at how we can intensify um, residential uses along them. So we really want to pay close attention to land use um, because it really is the driver of transportation, transportation trip making and characteristics. Um, you know, we're, we're out of greenfield development areas and uh, as the commercial and professional office land uses uh, turn over, that's really our biggest opportunity to add to housing. Um, but we want to try and make sure that it's done similar to what our urban core and areas inside New Circle Road more mimicked, which was um, you know, more compact mix of uses. You can see here on this drawing that you know, in those areas, the typical household vehicle miles, annual vehicle miles of travel are about 10,000 miles less per year than those areas outside of Mandela Boulevard. And a lot of that is indicative of the built environment. So with all that in mind, we challenged our consultants and our community to talk about, you know, how do we address our housing needs? How do we meet transportation needs? How do we achieve that better mix of land uses? And how do we make sure that it's done in a walkable, bike-friendly, transit-oriented way, and that we provide a transit service that is appealing enough that people really will choose to use. We were fortunate to have a public meeting uh, just before the pandemic really kicked in full swing. We had about 125 people attend, which is pretty good for a plan for us. You know, projects tend to bring people out, especially if there's controversy. Sometimes planning efforts are perhaps not quite so, um, I don't know, they, they don't draw the crowds, so to speak. So we, we did find that there were a lot of folks who really had something to tell us about Nicholasville Road. About 5,000 people took our survey and took the time to drop pins on a map to share with us where they thought the opportunities and the, the concerns were. And we worked to really make sure that we talked to the owners and operators of the road, including the transportation cabinet, our city traffic engineers, our transit system, which operates routes along the corridor, as well as the business owners and the property owners. Um, and some of the major employers like UK and some of the colleges. And then again, communicating to our policymakers along the way, which in this case includes our planning commission, our council, the Lextran board, and um, the NPR's policy board. 
So in terms of um, our survey, you know, about 43% of people said, yes, I shop pretty regularly on Nicholasville Road. About 25% of them were commuters. Somewhere around 15% of them either live on the corridor or another 15% work on the corridor. Um, many of them drive today. Some of them occasionally bike or walk and use transit. But a significant percentage of them, not all, did indicate that you know, they would be interested in getting around in other ways other than the vehicle if the, the services and the facilities were substantially better. And it did seem that there was you know, a great deal of support, yes, for, for more housing, yes, for, for moving more people, um, but we think there needs to be a better balance amongst our public land um, in terms of how our street space is allocated as well as our private land in terms of parking lots in particular. I think I saw a statistic once, the average community has eight to nine parking spaces per licensed driver. And um, a lot of communities have done the math and as our populations continue to grow, we, can't, we simply don't have the land to accommodate that kind of ratio long-term. So yeah, basically no one really likes using Nicholasville Road, regardless of how they're traveling today, any mode. Um, and they would be interested in doing some of these other things if there were drastic improvements. So we focused on three components of the plan. That was complete streets, um, implementing a bus route or a transit line, and creating more transit-oriented development. So um, Anne is going to talk a little bit more about those components. Um, all right, so we'll start off talking about complete streets, which I think is a term that most of us in this room are familiar with. Complete streets really just focus on providing safe access for all users. Um, we look at, at multimodal, um, we want to provide access for all modes of transportation. Uh, looking at the people, we want anyone, regardless of age, ability, or socioeconomic status, to be able to um, safely use the corridor. Complete streets are sustainable. Uh, they minimize impacts to the environment and they're very green. Uh, they hopefully encourage economic development and reinvestment into the community. They are integrated. They marry land use, transportation, the context. It's not a disjointed um, kind of street with you know, different uses. It all works together comprehensively. They're aesthetically pleasing and they are livable. They contribute to quality of life. So here's a picture that we like to show just to, uh, I think a lot of people when they hear complete streets think of something like downtown that's narrow with, you know, uh, high density. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It can be uh, a wider road where, again, you can see here that there's um, all the different roads are accommodated for. It's very visible. Um, there's clear demarcation for who goes where, so it's safe. Um, there's, it's well lit. There's um, it's aesthetically pleasing with trees. And so this is just one example of how the street can be retrofitted to be more complete, especially a street um, similar to Nicholasville Road. So how do we get there? We looked at a few tools that uh, we thought we could employ throughout this corridor to make it more of a complete street. First of that is bicycle and pedestrian enhancements. Um, we wanted to provide uh, a safe way for people to use the corridor. Um, bicyclists and pedestrians. So we thought providing a buffer uh, between those users and vehicular traffic is important. So that includes things like shared use paths and parking protected bike lanes. And then also enhancing the intersections to make them more visible and ADA compliant is important too. Um, finally, having connections to neighborhoods. There are a lot of neighborhoods that surround the corridor and that is a great opportunity to have people be able to access the amenities if they can get there safely. So we wanted to make sure that where uh, connections are lacking, that we recommend that they be added. Um, the second thing is access management, which again is something I think most of us are familiar with. Um, reducing curb cuts, full access points, eliminating some left turns, really can address um, improving safety and reducing congestion. KTC did a study um, that showed that along major arterials in Kentucky, that 30% of Crashes could be reduced, or crashes should be reduced, excuse me, by 30%, and delay could be reduced by up to 24% simply by employing access management. Turns and intersections are another opportunity. 
Um, we have a lot of really big congested intersections. And so if we look at things like innovative intersections or restricting left turns, um, allowing for U-turns mid blocks, some of those types of things can help improve traffic flow, but also make intersections more safe for other users. And then also those contribute to things like access management um, and just, in, I think I already said this, but improve traffic flow. And the final piece is placemaking. Uh, we really want to change the look and feel of Nicholasville Road and placemaking has the opportunity to provide that identity and sense of place. So adding things like intersection and crosswalk improvements, benches and outdoor seating areas, parklets, reclaimed sidewalk space, um, providing branding and wayfinding signage, uh, streetscape lighting, and even transit amenities and upgrades are all things that can really create that identity and make the corridor a much more, uh, I guess, pleasant place to be instead of just being someplace you're trying to get through. Hopefully it's a place where you want to stop and stay a while and live um, along the corridor. So we tied all these things together and put together uh, plans. We divided in the corridor into six segments. Um, they were character based, so you can kind of see what the six are and the, the character changes throughout the corridor. But for each of those segments, we included vehicular improvements, bicycle, pedestrian, and neighborhood connections, and also transit improvements. And so we brought all that together in a sheet that looks like this. There's six of them that you can um, take a look at the, the final plan on the, the project website. So if you're really interested in all the details, I won't go through it, but this just gives an example of some of the types of things that we're recommending. So some of those yellow lines are things are vehicular improvements like extending turn lanes, um, providing some additional connections or realignment of locations. Uh, we also recommend some innovative intersections and interchanges throughout the corridor. There are bike and ped connections. We, um, yeah, it might be, it's probably easier to see if you um, pull it up on the website, but you can see that there's, you know, new connections or areas where there's existing facilities that we recommend upgrading. And then finally, you can see the little dots that are transit stops and that red line is the, the BRT line that's recommended um, throughout the corridor. And on this section, we recommend bat lanes, which I'll explain here in a minute. So this kind of ties all of those pieces together. And one thing I think that I forgot to mention a couple slides back is we also, for the placemaking piece, we, this little map across the top of the uh, slide shows where some of those could be implemented as well. So hopefully when all these things are taken together, we have a much more complete road that really is, is safer, um, but also accommodates all users. So the next piece of the puzzle is bus rapid transit. Uh, bus rapid transit is basically like light rail, but it's much more flexible and it's much more affordable. Um, it's, you know, just light rail on, on rubber tires. It has a higher frequency than the typical local bus line, uh, faster speeds, it's more reliable, um, it's very accessible for all users, it's more comfortable and convenient. So hopefully you get the feel of what would be like a light rail system in another city, but again, it's just on it's on a bus. And here's a, a picture of one of the stops for the red line um, in Indianapolis. So you can see that that feels a lot different than maybe just your typical sign on the side of the street that says that this is a bus stop. Along Nicholasville Road, what we think that could look like, um, the BRT line would be eight miles long with 14 stations. So there's there, I think about every three quarters of a mile. There would be a park and ride location at the end of the line at Brandon Crossing, but the nice thing about BRT is that it's flexible. So in the future, it could be extended even further south down to Nicholasville if the demand was there. It serves all, all the mixed use along the um, corridor and there's a lot of big trip generators along Nicholasville Road. Um, a BRT line would cut travel time along the bus by 25% from the current number five route. Buses would run about every 10 to 15 minutes. And we, show throughout the corridor a mix of treatments. So along some sections, the bus would just run in mixed traffic, but it might have like a transit signal priority. Um, there's other sections where we recommend bat lanes and then others with center running bus lanes. So I'll talk about those for a minute here. Um, center running bi-directional bus only lanes. This is where the bus runs um, down the center of the street. So you basically take your existing two-way left turn lane and convert it to a bus only lane. The buses can run um, in both directions in the single lane and there's special signaling that makes sure that the buses, there's never two buses on the same section. 
Um, they can pass one another at stations, but this is nice because it really allows for you to maintain the existing traffic flow in both directions. Uh, but then it also gives the bus the opportunity to bypass traffic by running in that center lane. Uh, another thing that we found there's in Indianapolis, and you can see the two pictures at the top of the slide. Uh, those are pictures from the Indianapolis Red Line where they have a center running bus lane. But what they found is that that bus lane also provides a refuge for pedestrians, which if anyone is um, on UK's campus, you would agree that's probably a high priority. Um, and so they found, again, because the buses are only running every 10 to 15 minutes, they're not always there. And so that gives people kind of a place to land while they're trying to finish crossing the street. So we created this schematic that shows um, what a stop across like at the Memorial Hall location, uh, or yeah, Memorial Hall at UK's campus would look like. So you can see coming from the north and south, we just have a single lane. But then at the station, the buses can uh, pass one another in opposite directions. And it's nice because there's a signalized intersection right there. So pedestrians or riders get off in the middle, and then they have a signalized intersection to safely cross to whichever side they would need to be on. Um, the next treatment that we recommend, uh, this is from the Southland Drive to Manowar uh, section, is bus access transit lanes, um, also known as bat lanes. So this is where you just take the right curb lane and turn it into a bus only lane, but then you also allow vehicles to turn right. So this is, you can, the nice thing is that it can be done just with some paint and signage, so it's not terribly expensive, and it's also very flexible. You can have bat lanes running either full-time or you can make them run just at certain times of day. All you really need is a sign just telling people when they can, when these are bus only and right turn only lanes and when they're open to anybody. So again, this is a flexible, a flexible treatment that allows for the bus to have some more priority, but especially on the sections of Nicholasville Road where we're recommending it, there's already a lot of turning traffic due to the land uses. So you're not losing as much capacity as if you were to dedicate full lane just to buses. And here's a graphic we created that shows, this is the section of Nicholasville Road between Lexington Green and Reynolds Road. And so you can see the red lanes, it would be the bat lanes. And then vehicles are still three lanes of traffic in each direction, which we would want to maintain because of the high uh, traffic volumes, but it still allows that bus priority. And one thing that I want to note is the buildings on the north side that are shaded in yellow. That is, if you are familiar with this road, you know that that is not currently what buildings um, on that side of the road look like. And so these are uh, what higher density with the transit oriented development that Kenzie's going to talk about next, what that could look like if we really build up density around the BRT stations. And then finally, the stations. These are really the connection between the transportation and the land use. Um, stations are permanent. so. They're not going anywhere, so people can develop around them and know that they have a high quality, frequent transit service going to that, that spot. Um, they convey the identity and the image of the BRT line. They're often branded, and hopefully they are context sensitive and that they integrate with the surroundings. They are sheltered, so they provide you um, coverage from the elements. They're safe, they're visible, they have lighting, seating, uh, usually ticket kiosks, so you can purchase your ticket before you get on the bus. So that saves time. And then they also will have messaging, real-time information on when the next bus is coming, which is useful. Uh, they're very accessible. And here you can just see a few examples of, of what station, BRT stations um, in other locations look like. And so here's a map of the BRT stations that would be part of this the line along the Felicitable Road. Most of them correspond with, again, high trip generators like universities, hospitals, shopping areas. And so they lend well to developing more densely in those locations. People are already accessing them and it's just providing a, a better transit service. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kenzie and she's going to talk a little bit more about transit oriented development. So at um, each of the 14 stations, uh, our goal is to create higher nodes of density and mixed uses, particularly within a five mile walk to those stations. Um, and then sort of step down that density you know, within a, a 10 minute walk to those stations. And, and really the goal is to create kind of live, work, play, entertainment hubs of activity 
such that people can do a lot of the things they need to do for their day to day lives in that compact location. So we call these, these particular areas, we sort of created a buffer along all of the um, transit stops along the corridor. We call them station areas and transition areas. Um, we, we have certain guidelines that we intend to apply to those so that any parcels that are either fully or partially within these um, radii are subject to those design guidelines. And you can really see once you get to a half mile from every station, it, it really encapsulates the entirety of the front edge of the corridor. And we included dimensional standards uh, by certain typologies. If you look at the character of Nicholasville Road, it certainly changes, you know, really sort of the regional town centers, more in the suburban end where we're growing regional traffic for shopping destinations and other things, more of a sur suburban, you know, sort of local access uh, town center where you're talking more strip, um, small strip centers and so forth. And then, of course, there's a, there was a residential component, the neighborhood component of Nicholasville Road between the commercial areas and kind of the urban core and the campus center. So again, during um, throughout those buffers, we're looking for high density, uh, active ground level uses, ideally you know, retail or other professional services, um, discouraging or restricting street facing parking. The buildings are intended to be close to the street, not set back deeply, um, and really have uh, the parking lots being hidden from, from the street users. In the transition areas, we're looking for that gradual step down in density, um, particularly for those that have let residential areas. Um, so this photo here is from the Target and Lexington near campus. We have a number of developments that have come in over the course of the last five, maybe 10 years, where you really do see that mix of uses, higher density residential, three, four stories with, with ground level retail. This Target provides almost no, no parking because there's enough residential uses nearby to support um, that customer demand. And for the most part, everybody just walks to it. And this is just an example of what you can find in the plan. This is um, the uh, suburban town center. Um, so we're regulating the building heights, including both minimums and maximums, um, depending on, again, the typology and the distance from the station. Um, we are regulating setbacks, uh, the uses, and then also ground floor transparency, which is basically windows. We like to see lots of windows and not a lot of blank walls, um, and certainly parking standards. So Lexington has just recently moved from, or in the process in all zones, moved from providing parking minimums to parking maximums. And in certain zones, including our major commercial zone, we have already eliminated parking minimums, especially for residential uses, because we ran into a situation where a lot of our developments were maxed out on the buildable area or the buildings and the uses that they could add to those properties because they couldn't meet the parking minimums. So we've eliminated that barrier. And then to give the community and our elected officials a sense of, you know, what does TOD look like? What could it look like along this corridor? Just to kind of give them a visual sense of the, the type of density and the type of development we're looking for. We chose uh, three catalyst sites that kind of represent um, different types of development along the corridor. The first on the left is Emmer Farm owned by UK um, south of Main War Boulevard. It's one of the largest pieces of undeveloped land in Fayette County that's you know, still sort of a greenfield property as well as Fayette Mall in the center, which is kind of a regional um, build project. And then South Park, uh, just across the way at New Circle and Nicholas Wilbur is kind of a strip big box uh, retail retrofit. And I'm only gonna show you uh, Fayette Mall, but here you can see Fayette Mall and their vast seas of parking that appear to be underutilized at least during certain times of year and certain times of day. Um, and we wanted to show just sort of gradually over time, again, over time, not overnight, we could accommodate a lot more intensity along the site. And I wish I had brought the densities per unit um, with me today, but I don't have them. But I think they were somewhere around 20, 24 units per year, whereas typical development would be far, far less than that. Um, so you can see the orange buildings represent what we would propose to be multi story residential housing. Um, that actually interface with the street. The, the pink areas are sort of new gridded street patterns and um, plazas and open spaces and so forth. So that it feels a lot less like a vast um, sea of parking and more like an actual 
um, urban block. I guess you can see the, the transit stop. In the case of uh, Nicholasville Road, it was one of the only locations where we proposed that the BRT line would actually enter the property. So the dot sort of in the center, you can imagine a hub with very nice structural transit station and um, all the amenities nearby. And then finally, the plan you know, just kind of breaks, just like all plans do, out. You know, what are some short-term actions that we could take to try to get to this point? Um, what are some of the uh, more long-term things that we need to be thinking about? How might we fund this? Certainly, some of the first initial steps are to make adjustments to our zoning ordinance and our subdivision regulations. Um, we also need to perform some additional traffic analysis um, and modeling. Um, Hands group that sort of fatal flaw paths at the different treatments that are recommended along the corridor, but we need to dig into those a bit further, as well as to really evaluate you know, potential ridership and the cost of operating the, the transit service. I was a little surprised to learn through the, through the process that bus rapid transit, the operational costs are, can be pretty substantial compared to just a regular line. So um, before we part, we thought we would try to sort of hit on kind of some of the lessons learned or, or themes from the process that emerged. Um, first, I think that the public and our planning commission and our council, they did struggle a bit with trying to differentiate between kind of the, the long range vision of the corridor versus the immediate changes that we're planning. Um, I think there was you know, some confusion about that along the way. You know, this really is a pretty substantial change to the type of land development that we see along the roadway. Um, and there were a lot of concerns that it would create you know, immediate havoc. Um, but to the extent that there was pushback, uh, it did seem that everyone could agree that um, you know, change occurs all the time. And we can, it's, it's inevitable, and we can either guide that change for better outcomes or accept kind of the status quo. So um, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of uh, people who are thrilled with the status quo. So even if they didn't like what was being proposed, they could at least you know, identify the need to try and steer it in perhaps a different direction. And then of course there's you know different opinions and preferences in any community. It seemed more, you know, the neighborhoods and the people near campus and near to downtown were much more open and interested in more of the multimodal improvements. They, they're excited about BRT, um, whereas the people along the far south end of the community They've chosen to live in low density areas because that's their personal preference and they don't necessarily mind driving everywhere, although they don't particularly like traffic. Um, so I think that kind of led to some amount of choice rider skepticism. Like, you know, nobody rides the bus today, which actually isn't true, but that's the perception. So why on earth would we spend all this time and energy and money trying to get more people to ride the bus? It's just not something that people in Lexington are ever gonna do. And trying to communicate to those who they are in no way know how. They're, they're just never going to do it. But there is a segment somewhere in the middle between people who are dependent on transit and people who absolutely have no desire to ride it. And that it's a benefit to all of us, even those who will never use it, to get that, that, that middle group to use public transit and, and to try and free up that space in the roadways as well. Um, So yes, sort of getting back to um, the differing opinions, there was certainly a lot of um, concern from the neighborhood when we started this process that we were going to apply kind of a one size fits all to the corridor, one cross section all the way down the line, didn't matter about context. Um, so you can see that you know through the UK section where we know we have a lot of potential captive transit users, we really prioritized getting the bus through as fast as possible with the um, center running bi-directional lane. To the neighborhood, the bus just rides with mixed traffic because they really wanted medians and pedestrian refuges and wider sidewalks and calm and slow traffic. Whereas at the um, commercial end, we recognize there's still gonna be a lot of cars that we have to move through those areas. So we wanna try and strike that balance with those, those um, fat lanes. Then in terms of managing expectations, we had a lot of folks who really want this now. In fact, they want it yesterday. And then we have a lot of folks who think the sky is falling and that we're going to create gridlock and they never, ever, ever want to see us do this. And there's one gentleman that ran for council just to fight that in particular. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we don't really know when we're going to be ready to implement the various pieces and parts of this. Um, it is going to be years in the making. 
Um, while we try and answer some of those questions, identify funding and then improvement projects, we all know how long the project development process can take. Um, and so we are kind of struggling with sort of the chicken or the egg, what comes first. You know, one thing that we can do pretty quickly if we get buy-in from elected officials is to change our zoning ordinance and implement these design guidelines. But, you know, is it fair to regulate development towards transit-oriented design standards if we don't have the BRT in place? And then likewise, if we implement the BRT, but we don't have the support of land uses, does it fail? So it's kind of trying to find that, that balance and that nuance there. And in terms of the regulatory hurdles, you know, our planning commission adopted this plan as part of the comprehensive plan. So we really do feel that we have their buy-in. Of course, they've been educated a lot on transit-oriented development and what that looks like and why it's important for our overall growth strategy. But even if the planning commission approves the, the, the changes to the ordinances, the city council has to as well. So there's a lot of education and um, buy-in that we need to gain from them in that regard. And then I think finally, um, the fact of the matter is, I do think it's probably likely that it has to get a little bit worse before it gets better. I think Lexington is probably going to have to continue to feel the pressure of our lack of housing um, before, and particularly the development community really gets serious about looking at some different um, business models and types of development that they are looking to build in our community because ultimately they're the ones that, that have to do that. And, you know, Likewise, traffic on McCrystal Road probably has to continue to get a little worse before everybody sort of accepts that this is where we're at and you know, we're going to have to think outside the box to solve this problem because um, we can't do it. You know, status quo isn't working. With that, we may have just three minutes for questions. If anybody has any in our eye, we'll be happy to entertain them. Oh, here's the website, imaginelexington.com. You can circle around there probably pretty quick and find Imagine Nicholasville Road and just want to acknowledge this was a partnership between the city planning, the MPO, Lextran, and then our consulting team was WSP and KSK as our designers and Razor as our uh, public outreach, outreach experts. So our stops are Brandon Crossing, um, the Walmart, and the Summit, sort of right across the, the way from one another, Fayette Mall, um, South Park at Lexington Green, and then so on down into town. I mean, our goal and our hope is that we would have the BRT line run all the way into downtown Nicholasville. We didn't include them in this plan because we were really going to be talking about a lot of regulatory framework, and there was more interest in doing that component of it in Fayette County, and it was Fayette County that funded the study, even though the MPO is involved and we have jurisdiction over both. But yes, we're, we're, we're thinking park and ride, particularly for UK employees, because there's a lot of incentive at UK not to drive a car. It's very expensive. They'll give you a free bus pass. Uh, you can sometimes get faster door to door using a transit service, et cetera. So we think that's one of our biggest audiences for park and ride. Part of the reason we looked at BRT on Nicholasville Road, there's a lot of indication from some research that uh, Lextran has done. There was an alternative analysis that preceded this, which is kind of a transit term for different things that they look for along the corridor as to what's the best service to get the most bang for the buck. So that had already been proposed for Nicholasville. Um, we have a lot of real major destinations and employment generators that really lend itself well to bus rapid transit. We are looking at enhanced transit for all of our major corridors, again, because we're really looking to densify them and we want to accommodate those trips in a different way. 
it may look different for different corridors. The next one that we're looking at is Northeastern Circle Road, the signalized portion. And um, we didn't specify in the RFP DOT exclusively because we're not sure that it has some of the same characteristics that Nicholson Road does. It will all be a bit unique. We won't rule it out, but we're not pre presuming it either. Steve is uh, letting us know our time is up. Yeah, I want to thank our presenters today. I want to thank each of you for, for attending this afternoon. Let's have a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. Well, we were even thinking, like, is there a way you could do, like, 